Good morning, everyone. Today is December the, what is that, the 13th, 15th, 13th, 13th. 13th. <laughs> lucky 13. Um, <laughs> this is our last public event of the year for Health Advocate X. Before we start, um, I'm sure that everybody's you know, thinking about the holidays, I was lucky enough to be with both my kids in Malibu, California, and that's where this particular land acknowledgement uh, comes from for this morning. So we acknowledge that we have been on and are on the traditional land of the first people of the Shumash and Makawankan, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the tribes, and we invite you to join us in acknowledging and thanking the indigenous people for their stewardship, wherever you and they may be. So with that, um, most of you all know how this works, that we, um, we go over news of the day for the pandemic, and we're very honored to have Dr. Dale Reisner, who is a health advocate ex board member and also medical director of safety and quality at OBGYN at Swedish Health Services. And it feels like forever since we last uh, spoke, but uh, Dale's going to give the rundown of what's going on in our world. Dale? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, I keep thinking there'll be less to talk about, but that doesn't seem to be the case. So I'm gonna, um, for those who may not have been on before, I'm gonna run through the, just the numbers um, a little bit, just a little bit uh, to start off. Um, so as of yesterday, I haven't, I didn't look this morning, but this is close enough. We globally have over 270 million cases around the world uh, with uh, over 5.3 million deaths all from COVID-19. Um, interestingly, the death rate per case rate, and again, we know that our case rate is not exactly accurate and this might be the problem, but when you look at global, it's 1.9% of cases, um, documented cases. In the United States, it's 1.6%. And in the US, we've had oh, almost 50 million cases. It's 49.7 million. Um, we've had almost 800,000 deaths from COVID-19. Uh, they continue. Um, and um, I, I took a quick look at Canada, our nearest neighbor, um, and um, I'm kind of from there. so. I pay attention. I have a relative, two relatives there, um, and they're um, much smaller numbers. It's a way less populated country, um, but they're running the same 1.6% um, case to, to death rate. So that seems to be pretty consistent. Um, I really think that's kind of overcalling it. It's probably closer to one or a little over one because we are not testing everybody who's positive. And particularly, we do not know without universal testing, we don't know who's asymptomatic positive. And we, in many people that are mildly positive are, you know, home with a cold like symptoms uh, and so on. So I think if we really had full case ascertainment, which we don't have, um, the death rate probably would be a little bit lower than what um, the percentages I just quoted. Um, the good news in the US is that we are up to 76 and a half percent across the country ages five and up of at least having one vaccine uh, shot. Um, fully vaccinated um, is less than that. Um, if you look at what numbers that is, um, so fully vaccinated across the um, United States is 202 million people. Um, and uh, almost 54 million have had a, a booster. So fully vaccinated plus boosted. So um, we are coming along. Um, and uh, if you haven't either um, accessed um, vaccination, um, if there's been some vaccine hesitancy and you're not someone that would never vaccinate, please, uh, please, it is very safe. It's been around for over a year now. Um, the um, 
The only caution is Johnson and Johnson, which might be appealing because it's one shot, um, is um, a little bit, very small rates, but a little bit more uh, concerning for women um, of reproductive age. So reproductive age running from, you know, teens to 50s actually. Um, and so uh, if you are in that um, category, you know someone in that category, um, direct them to either Pfizer or, or Moderna if they haven't been vaccinated already. And just one thing, I'm not going to talk a lot about boosters, but CDC has said, get whatever is available. It's fine to switch between Moderna and Pfizer in particular. They seem to be more available in most places. J&J is also recommending a booster for their single shot. Um, but um, if you had Pfizer for a full set of vaccination and you have access to get Moderna or you prefer to get Moderna, you're welcome to cross over. There's no data that says that's better. There's no suggestion that that's a problem. So, um, so just feel free that if you're if you've got one fully vaccinated and you have access to get the other one, get it. Do, you know, it's been at least six months since you've been fully vaccinated. You should uh, avail yourself of that. And part of the reason for this is that Delta is still huge um, in this country. We still have increasing. You may live in an area where it's not on the increase. But they're still across the country. The majority of the country is still having increased numbers of cases. And Delta still is 99% of those. However, uh, Omicron is now in about half of our states. Um, over 21 of the 50 states have had cases that are attributable to Omicron. It spreads really easily. There is work happening um, as we speak with gathering data from Africa on um, who's getting it. Um, are, there is a concern that you can get it more readily, even fully vaccinated, or if you had wild virus of one of the variants before. Um, it, doesn't necessarily look like it's any more severe, but um, it's probably quite comparable to, to the Delta. So I'm gonna talk a fair amount about Omicron today because it's new and it's on the move. And I suspect it will overtake Delta at some point in the next month or two in terms of being the, the predominant um, variant um, because it's so readily transmissible. So, it was initially characterized as a new variant, a variant of interest um, in November. And um, the moment that happened, the three drug companies that produce a vaccine that are available in the United States um, and the um, and, uh, and some other uh, companies that uh, have uh, vaccinations that are um, in other places that we just don't have in the US yet, started working on it. Um, the um, Moderna, Pfizer, um, and Johnson & Johnson are all pursuing a, an Omicron variant um, adjustment to their existing vaccine. And there's a company um, that has filed for authorization with the FDA um, that's not here in the US yet is called Novavax. And it has an Omicron targeted offering that they are hoping to be able to test and manufacture in the next few weeks. So they will probably be the first to have something specific uh, targeting Omicron. So that is so fast. Can I just jump in there? Is yeah, it the same yeah. type? I mean, so, I mean, we've never seen vaccine development this quick. So can you you know, dumb, dumb down for us that don't understand kind of how these things get, get done. How did that happen? I'm going to exactly talk about that. Oh, okay. Oh, Robin. look at that. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going to run through some of this stuff about how vaccines, um, you know, we, we talked a little bit in the past about how they get created in the first place and, um, and what can get done in a, 
in a safe way in what period of time we'd be looking at. Um, because I think this is a really telling story of where we are in the biomedical area when, when it comes to vaccinations, that is actually one of the th few things that's really sort of hopeful and promising. So I'm, I'm hoping that this will be helpful for understanding. Um, you know, one of the challenges with, with coronavirus, uh, many viruses will mutate. Um, our flu virus mutates on a regular basis every year, right? Um, coronavirus, um, it, the flu is actually a coronavirus, it's just not a COVID-19, but um, the this particular um, uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is the science name for coronavirus-19, um, really evolves quickly. And because we didn't already have vaccinations available and because they're so unequally spread across the world, it's really easy whenever there's a host that um, the virus can pop into for it to, it to start um, uh, developing uh, different uh, mutations to make it be more stable within that host. Um, so we, we kind of had the perfect scenario for this virus to hop on and, and, and you know, establish itself. Um, the um, original data out of Africa suggested that, yeah, you might get it, but it's not that bad. But now we're starting to see, they just had a death in the United Kingdom and we're starting to see that in vulnerable people, it's gonna have a similar effect as what we've seen with the other um, coronavirus um, uh, COVID-19 uh, variants. So what really appears to be of concern um, for all of us is that, um, like we've got it in Washington state. I mean, you could look at the um, CDC and the, the, you'll see all the states that's been um, identified in so far. Again, not very large numbers, um, but the rate of infection amongst those who are um, either had the wild virus um, for COVID-19 or have been previously vaccinated seems to be very um, much more transmissible than Delta has been. So it still may only give us mild disease. Um, we don't know and won't know if we're gonna see um, the same kind of risk of long COVID or any of the other things that we have seen emerge from the first variants that we um, been dealing with the last two years. So can I just clarify there? Mm -hmm. So what you said was that if people got COVID from the wild, the wild type is when you get COVID, right? When you so get the disease, yes. When you get the disease yeah. or you've been vaccinated that this new variant, the Omicron variant is more easily, you can, you can still get it. You can still get it, yes. and we just don't know if it if it um, activates long COVID symptoms or not. We don't know. Right. We okay. We, I just we, want to make sure I understood that. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and we probably won't um, for a while. Um, the I think the, the the way to think about it is if you get the virus and you and you recover from it, you have antibodies from the virus. And it's the same thing when we get vaccinated. We have antibodies and they last for X period of time. And it's become really clear that the antibodies, um, and it may be um, in part because of the aggressiveness of, the, of this particular coronavirus or whether it is um, because of the variants that we're seeing, but <clears throat> the antibodies don't last as long as we might like, like so that we are talking about boosters at six months. You know, we started at eight months. Now there's um, data that you, we get waning uh, protection over six months. And so the, the concern is that you can still get sick. You can still be asymptomatic and transmit it to somebody else, right? And we're going to talk about that a little bit later um, in the hour. Um, the reason that Omicron seems to have really a, a facility for making for getting us infected is there are more than 30 different mutations in the spike protein. So there are lots of ways that this virus can kind of skirt around our immune system and, and create 
an infection, whether it's an illness or whether it's just an infection, you've got the virus, but you're not sick, um, is, you know, up, up to how your body responds. And, and if you have any coexisting um, medical problems um, or um, high uh, body weight or those kinds of things that put us more at risk, um, age, all the, all the things that we know. So um, the fact that the, that the uh, companies are jumping on this so quickly is pretty awesome because what they're trying to do is to say, well, we can't, our traditional uh, approach to making vaccinations has been, so you find something about the shape of the virus or the way it attaches or the types of cells it attaches to, and then you, you um, make your vaccination um, work on those things. Um, either it's target cells. So we're gonna, you know, make the make the um, vaccination say, you know, coat the target cells so that the virus can't get in. Or maybe we're gonna alter um, the spike protein on the on the um, virus so that there's enough of that circulating that the virus get, may enter. But it's like, oh, we're already here, and they leap, right? They, they don't continue to procreate. They procreate is probably not the right word. Viruses um, multiply in a different way. But so, um, so the thing that's super cool about these mRNA vaccines that um, we have for this particular um, virus is that um, they're much easier to modify um, the structure of the vaccine. Um, than most other types of vaccines. And for most of our other vaccines, we really haven't had to do that. You know, our measles, mumps, rubella vaccines have been the same forever. Flu is really the closest example where we where we know there's mutations and, and, and that has to be modified. And actually common cold, there are new mutations all the time. That's why you don't just get one cold when you're a kid and never have to have it again when you're an adult. You get, you know, you get around a, a little kid with a snotty nose and you've got another cold. So um, the, the thing that's amazing is that really the process to change, once they've identified what they're gonna do, the, because the vaccines are already approved, the process to tweak them a little bit requires that they may maintain the vaccine um, in, its, in its original formulation primarily, and they make a minor change and it only takes um, testing on a smaller uh, population to be sure that that hasn't altered what we expect, um, both in terms of side effects and also um, effectiveness. And the process um, may be done in a few months. So it's in safely. Amazing. So it's just it's amazing. Really amazing. Yeah. It's really amazing. Yeah. And we have the model of the flu vaccine that you typically in the spring, they take, you know, the, the mutations that they saw the, this last flu season and, you know, they would um, modify their vaccines. So it's all going to be done according to the way it's set up already to be safe. Um, and it will be, and, and because of uh, the mRNA, at least with both Pfizer and Moderna, um, that um, model will be easy to, to modify. Um, any questions about that? I know it's kind of science-y. <laughs> well, it's just, it's very, very interesting. Um, and I think we talked about this um, when we were doing prep yesterday, but so... Do people think that eventually we'll all at one time or another get some kind of COVID? Maybe. <laughs> like is that? Maybe. Will yeah. it be as yeah. common as the flu and over time, will it be less virulent yeah. or? You know, you, you will have some people that will probably, you know, never encounter the flu in their entire life. But um, I think you're going to find that, um, that COVID is going to be very similar. Um, you'll you'll have people that um, may never have it, but always get vaccinated, and and so you know keep themselves protected against getting it. Mm -hmm. You'll have people that get it and may never get it again. Um, uh, we do know pretty much that you don't get lifetime immunity like you do from some of the other um, viral illnesses that we you know have as chick chickenpox or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of advocacy, the reason why people should continue to push for vaccination is that long COVID side effects are really devastating. 
potentially. Yeah, and they're tricky because they um, we're seeing them more often with milder disease. We're not seeing the long COVID as much. We're seeing other things. So you may have permanent lung damage if you have really mm -hmm. severe respiratory stuff and you're in the ICU and you're on ECMO or you know other things are going on. You can have the thrombotic effects like stroke. Uh, mm -hmm. some of the other things that could, would create long-term complications. But the long COVID symptoms that are so weird are seem to happen more with the people that just have the loss of um, taste and smell, you know, or that have mild disease that they're not even admitted to the hospital. Or, or asymptomatic. I mean, we saw- for, Asymptomatic, yes. Right, so for people that didn't attend our conference and Ashley is, is working on putting all of those sessions online and they should be available soon. The um, session with Diana Barrent on long COVID, she talks about this um, and it's it, it cannot be overstated that what they have seen in their community of 170,000 people that have long COVID is that the worst side effects happen in asymptomatic cases. So it's really surprising. Yeah. And we're also starting to see, you know, I have to throw a little something in about obstetrics because that's my specialty. Yes. <laughs> but, um, we're also starting to see, it was not clear and it still isn't clear about whether there might be miscarriages, but we are starting to see some stillbirths and oh, they wow. tend to be in people who did not have a severe case mm. and they tend to happen like a month or more out from the initial infection. And um, so, so that's in unvaccinated pregnant women. Correct. Mm. Correct. Yeah. That's the, that's, but yeah. again, these are case reports. Yeah. Um, we don't have even statistics on that. I don't think you need to scare people, but I think mm -hmm. for pregnant women that are hesitant, they're worried that the vaccines are risk for their pregnancy really need to understand that that the vaccine is nothing compared to the, mm -hmm. the COVID virus um, effects on either them, their life. I mean, we've, we've seen very early preterm deliveries. We've seen, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's some people that are, that are um, so sick that they have to learn to walk again. They have to learn. We had one patient that had to learn how to use her hands again. She was so weak. Mm -hmm. It's devastating. Mm -hmm. um, what you can go through um, after, and then, you know, a cesarean section at 24 weeks is a, means a C-section forever. I mean, these things are not benign. Um, yeah, yeah. If everybody makes it through. So, um, so yeah, there's lots to, um, to really help people understand. And, and it's good that we have more information, that it's more balanced, where, where we will eventually have um, an, an ability to say, you know, this is your risk, this is not a risk. And, and that as long as the um, vaccinations are around for a longer period of time, I think it, that mm -hmm. will be normalized as well. Yeah. Um, so. we, had a, we had a question from Ann Thomas, so just a clarification. Is the Omicron Novavax vaccine the mRNA uh, technology? I believe it's mRNA. I have not explored that. So too. I, yeah. yeah, I think it is. MRNA. I don't know. Somebody can probably look it up, but yeah. maybe I'll do that. Um, right. Yeah. You know, I'm curious um, because we're vaccinating children and we don't do that with the flu. Like, mm. wouldn't that mean that there would be better, like less opportunity for, you know, I, I had this question because there's women I know who are not vaccinating their children because they're worried about the vaccine. But, mm -hmm. you know, my point is, well, you know, they're still at risk and it's not just from five to 11, it's the rest of your life. So right. I'm curious right. if you think that because we're doing kids, if that will be a better preventative. And then I'm also curious, do you think they're going to go down to zero for babies? Because I've had that question as well. Well, they probably won't go down to zero. Uh, the best thing for babies is breast milk um, with, with um, moms that either have, 
you know, recently had the virus so that they still have circulating antibody or that get vaccinated. Um, and we are recommending that um, anyone with COVID disease that they get from the virus um, consider getting vaccinated about a month after they have their, or when they recover, if, it, if it's a longer recovery, um, because of not knowing how long uh, that protection will last. And some people may choose to wait a little bit longer, but um, so for infants, um, there are many vaccinations that, that young babies don't get. Um, and we want them to be able to mount a, an immune response of their own, which their bodies are not ready to do right away. And so anything we can give them passively, which is, you know, breastfeeding um, with mom having antibodies is the best way to go for the, for the infants. It will probably at some point go down to, it might go down to six months um, or a year. Um, I'm not, I won't be surprised if, if it goes down to like, you know, cause right now, that we have the five-year-olds, but we're, you know, there's gonna be younger that um, probably will go down at least to two to five, probably will be covered before long. Um, um, Del, uh, Michael Wood, a fellow board member asked uh, just a little bit more information about Omicron and the widespread, since it's many times more transmittable than Delta, will that actually start to create a wide, worldwide herd immunity. And we chatted a little bit about worldwide herd mm -hmm. immunity before. So uh, he'd like to know about that. Yeah, nobody knows <laughs> whether herd immunity is going to apply to this because of the, the amount of um, mutations that we see. So like we don't really have herd immunity to the flu. If we quit vaccinating, we would all, you know, have a greater risk of catching the flu and we would have a risk of dying from the flu. You know, before, even with vaccinations, flu kills people that are vulnerable. Again, the uh, more the elderly and people with other, um, other medical complications that are, that leave them immunosuppressed. So, um, so I'm not sure. I think the idea of herd immunity with that kind of goal of 80% of vaccination is definitely going to improve things, but do we ever, do we ever keep it? Do we, you know, I don't know that we ever let our guard down on this one. I think this is going to be with us. Um, it would be nice if it would pick a season instead of be all year, because that's getting to be very frustrating for people <laughs> to try to run around and avoid it. And still, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit before we're done. Mm -hmm. The very best thing you can do is keep your friends and family close and the people you don't know so well away and so that physical distancing when you go out in public i find people are getting close behind me i put my shopping cart behind me <laughs> and then i can control how far i am away from the person mm -hmm. in front of me i always wear a mask um you know make sure you you clean your hands and um surfaces and stuff like that so we still need to do that if you look at the um imht which is out of the university of washington but it's the predictive modeling we have quoted a number of times there's a prediction for a bump again um after the new year's um end of january february uh, from people getting together celebrating um and um when you go out even when you go out in the grocery store look around and see if people have masks on most of the time, chunk of the time, they're not wearing them properly. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I see people with the mask below their nose. And that's not that's the chin, not the chin diapers. We call them chin diapers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then now I'm not going to, and I would normally speak up and now I'm afraid they're carrying a weapon. So I don't say anything, you know, I'll, or I'll go to the, to the store and say like, are you guys enforcing the mask or not? But mm -hmm. no, I just walk the other way. So you need to be hyper alert because people mm -hmm. are pretending or they walk in this door with the mask on and then they take it down and it's, you know, a beard cover. <laughs> oh yeah. So you do have to be super careful still. And I think the Omicron, it really brings it to the forefront that, um, we, we don't know how quickly it's going to spread. Um, I suspect we'll, we'll see more of it um, in the news. And, and ideally, 
as it is spreading, the fact that these drug companies can get an Omicron targeted vaccination ready by February, even it may not help us right now, it may not help us in January, but that's huge to be mm -hmm. on top of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, but getting back to this herd immunity thing, mm -hmm. just, just to be like super uber clear, we, this is not going away. We are not going to get herd immunity so that enough of us have had it where it does not uh, kill people basically. Yeah. Yep. Just and, and to be so clear. The, that is what we are aiming for is mm -hmm. So that even if you get it, you're not going to get to, you're not going to need to go to the hospital. You're not going to need to be on a ventilator or in an intensive care unit. You're not going to get the severe complications that can come with it. And, um, and so um, then it's an illness and, you know, you stay away from other people while you're sick and you get better and you move on and you will ideally not have these other things. We don't know if the mild disease that you get once you're vaccinated is at all a risk for long COVID. We don't know that at all because we haven't had fully vaccinated people around long enough. I'm not seeing reports of that yet or at all. Um, mm -hmm. So it'll be something worth watching because I think we, especially with the younger people, you know, there's been some devastating things with young, real healthy, normal body weight teenagers and young mm -hmm. adults getting super bad long COVID that's gonna affect their whole lives. And yeah. so if, if vaccination will avoid that, that will be amazing. And also people that don't know if they've had COVID that have mysterious mm -hmm. symptoms all of the sudden out of the blue that lead to not being able to walk and things. Just right. like, you know, I've just heard this anecdotally too which yeah. Yeah. I don't know if there will be, I mean, it brings up a question for me because I actually had somebody who is in his sixties contact me and say, you know, I was sick, not necessarily COVID. I don't know, but after, you know, delayed after that, I had all these symptoms, a lot of them, uh, autonomic nervous system symptoms, but really severe. So in the future, how will the medical system address finding out covering or kind of sewing the symptoms together to be able to treat? I mean, I know we didn't prep or anything about this and this, you might not be able to answer this question, yeah. but. So, so here's what I would say is I think the treat um, is going to be pretty much disease specific. So we know already, for instance, um, type one diabetes. So type one diabetes, you may get as a kid or you may get as a young adult, or there are cases that come up later in life. We know that there are family risks for that. Mm -hmm. And so you may have a genetic tendency and may never have it develop. And we also know that it can develop after a viral illness, even a common cold. So there's something about when a virus mm -hmm excess and we have a response to that virus that can either um, promote an existing sensitivity, you know, mm -hmm. genetic predisposition, or can create symptoms that are autoimmune-like and neurologic. I mean, there's so many of these things that we, we see a pre-existing viral insult that's not a big deal then mm -hmm. uh, ever since I had that whatever, you know, I've got this problem. So I think the targeted treatments are going to be based on what is the problem rather than the specific virus that caused it. There, I mean, yeah. there are circumstances where that's different, like with, um, with zoster, or, uh, you know, which we know the virus and, and we, we will use antiviral specific to the zoster. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right. Um, but I mean, where you have something that's more of a systemic thing, like a, like a dysautonomia, right? Which mm -hmm. is a basket of symptoms with the dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system. Right, right. Which we then, know is impacted by this. Yes, virus. and we also know that it comes from other things, you know, mm -hmm. maybe talking about pot syndrome um, in part mm -hmm. where perox 
paroxysmal, I can't say that word very well. Um, and it's um, it, where you get tachycardia and you, we have other right. things where, um, where you have um, uh, different either vital signs that, um, that um, get altered or your ability to monitor your, your to um, coordinate your body temperature. Um, there's a lot of things like that. Uh, neurologic symptoms that come and go um, myasthenia gravis. We have, um, you know, things that can affect myasthenia. There's a tendency for muscles to, to not um, respond the way they should. Mm -hmm. And we have other um, types of viral illnesses that, um, that, that trigger neurologic conditions. And then what ends up happening is it's the neurologic condition that that people try to figure out how to how to get, make the nerves not fire as much or get the nerves to trigger in a more regular way, rather than attacking the particular virus that caused the problem. So I mm -hmm. think that's that's kind of where we'll end up because mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of people that we we have weird symptoms in, and it may have been COVID or maybe something else altogether. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think people we're getting a little bit off topic, but. Mm -hmm. Um, the whole idea of viruses causing uh, different things like, you know, my dad died of brain cancer and there's some l new emerging evidence that virus causes glioblastoma brain tumor, which I, which I mean, we just don't know. So it's interesting. Anyway, so yeah. back to the topics. <laughs> Sorry, okay. we got a little bit, got, got okay. off a yeah. little bit onto yeah. one hole there. Well, I just wanted to wind up this piece of it a little bit about, um, about the vaccines is that, um, the, the, um, existing vaccines are felt to be at least covering Omicron. So you don't need to feel like you don't have any coverage at all. The question is whether it can totally prevent the, the infection in the first place to the same degree. And we won't know that for a while. Um, <clears throat> so the other, which is why I sort of did my little, you know, wash your hands and stay far away from strangers. Um, the, um, the, comments that I ran across, and I think these are really salient to the discussion we've just had, is that even if the original vaccinations that we have for COVID-19 are less effective against Omicron, um, what they do is they stimulate our T cells, which are immune cells, to respond and antibody producing B cells. So the T cells are the re over response kind of thing that we see. Um, and we'll have that happening even if we don't have Omicron specific because it's still the same family. It's still got spike proteins and it still acts in the same way. So as these vaccines get tweaked, what they may be suggesting is get a booster of this you know, one that has better Omicron coverage and that will really depend on how quickly that gets uh, not only processed, um, not only manufactured, but processed through the FDA um, to, um, to test them and to be sure that they're safe and then to have uh, available to us. So, so I would say, thinking about spring probably um, for when that those kinds of Omicron specific. And you'll note it's interesting that there's a lot of talk about this Omicron that didn't happen about Delta, right? Nobody was running so why around. So why is that? Yeah. I don't... It's because of the number of mutations. Oh, okay. So the prior mutations have been one or two spike proteins and our existing vaccinations have worked quite well against those. But when you have 30 different mutations in one new variant, um, that's gonna be a little bit more of a challenge. And so that's why people jumped on it. It's like, of course, it's, it's easy to transmit because it's got itself facilitated to be you know, a super virus really. Um, so the, the important thing to think about here is that and this is not going to happen as quickly as our Omicron specific uh, vaccination um, improvements. But 
What manufacturers are looking at already now is a universal vaccine against coronavirus 19, you know, and they will be probably doing the same thing with the flu. Instead of buffing it each year with the latest mutants that come along, they're going to they're going to look to find essential features. So without certain essential fe features that virus would not exist. And rather than, you know, specific things for spike proteins, it may be maybe a key spike protein and then maybe something about the core. Uh, and then we will have something that is much more likely to knock this virus out. Mm. Um, that's probably two years from now. Yeah, wow. Yeah, wow. yeah. Wow. that's going to take a lot of work, going to take a lot of um, creative work in the first place. And then it will take new testing, unlike these, these little buff to the original models. Yeah. Um, you know, which is kind of a simplistic way to say what they're doing with the with the vaccinations right now with um, the Omicron adjustments. Yeah. Um, Lisa Casaro uh, put a question in the chat. Thanks, Lisa. Can you please refresh us as to whether the various vaccines have actual FDA full approval or are they still on the EUA uh, status, the early, you know, access? So they could see, they got preliminary like rush approval, right? They got preliminary, yes. Um, I don't, I think, I, I don't know how to address Johnson & Johnson. I think it's fully approved. I know that Moderna and Pfizer both are. Um, they're not fully approved yet. They're, they're under EUA for some of the younger ages. Mm -hmm. um, those were provisional um, and, um, and timely and appropriate uh, in order to, because look what's happened with schools and stuff. Yeah. Um, so, um, so yes, but the, the two main ones we have in the, in the US um, uh, have been uh, fully approved by the FDA. Um, I did wanna mention, um, and thank you, Beth, Beth Droppert uh, mentioned um, this, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the holidays and kind of how to how to help manage those. But before that, um, um, Centers for uh, Medicare and Medicaid um, Services uh, create sets of guidelines for for uh, different types of um, physical locations for care. And for nursing homes, they have now mandated as of um, early November that visitation is allowed for all residents at all times. So this is really great, but also really challenging. Um, and I don't know if we have any of our, um, of our friends from some of the, um, uh, the different full care facilities on the call today, but um, it means that um, in order to have that happen, um, we will be looking at um, requirements um, that maybe you have to be fully vaccinated or that may even be, you need to have a test. Um, in order to have um, these facilities that are um, full of patients that have limited mobility that can't go outside and you know that may be in shared spaces, um, to have the visitors that they need to stay healthy um, emotionally and physically. Um, so I think um, this is new. I'm sure that all of these facilities are adjusting currently. It's, it's good, it's the right thing to do. We've seen so many losses along the way because people didn't, particularly with the dementia um, patients where where there were earlier deaths and so on because they lost contact with their loved ones. So this is super great, but it's gonna present, you know, there's there's no such and, thing. And we're so lucky because about a, an yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Tina, Tina Hall from yeah, Era, Era Living is here. Hey. So uh, Tina, no do you comments? wanna? Yeah. yeah. So, so what, what this is meaning in, in our communities and, and the, the thing is, I think communities have really been trying to move more and more towards bringing people in because that social isolation piece is so, so hard on residents. Um, a lot of rapid tests happening. 
you know, um, there's there, uh, the screening, which I mean, the screening has been just a part of our life from when we first started allowing, you know, those 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 uh, essential visits in. But um, yeah, the the screening process is very rigorous. People are being asked to vaccinate. Um, we can't mandate that our residents be mandated simply because some of them can't be vaccinated. Right. You know, so so if someone is coming to visit, we're, you know, um, I, I don't think we're yet at a point where we're mandating visitors be vaccinated. But I wouldn't be surprised, at least with privately owned companies, if that's where we're going. I don't I don't know how that's going to work for for some of the the nonprofit companies or or, or that sort of thing, or those yeah. with any sort of an affiliation with with the state um, that, that maybe have a, a Medicaid contract or something, but for mm -hmm. private companies, I wouldn't be surprised if that's where we're going because right now the, the resident population is, is for the most part vaccinated and boosted. All of the employees are vaccinated and boosted. Um, and we're doing rapid the rapid tests all the time. Like if, even when I go into the communities with having been vaccinated and having my booster and working from home when I'm, when I'm, uh, you know, for the most part, I'm still doing rapid tests pretty regularly whenever I go in to visit. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's going to be just, that's going to be with us for, you know, who knows how long. So there's yeah. a lot of investment in testing happening right now. And then when there are things that we, we have the option of not doing live, we're not, you know, mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of communities used to do all kinds of open events where they would invite the public in to, you know, for lectures and what have you. Those are not live yet. Um, we, we fully expected that they would be in this year and they're really not. And even looking into next year, we're not planning a lot of live things, at least not in first quarter, because we, you know, we, we don't want to create more risk for residents where, where someone could come through and say they're vaccinated, but they're not vaccinated or, or whatnot. You know, the masking policy is very rigorous, mm -hmm. social distancing, very rigorous. You know, I think communities are, are taking every precaution they reasonably can. Um, but no matter what you do, you know, we're never going to completely eliminate risk. It's just, it's just not possible unless we're just, you know, hermetically sealing our buildings, which <laughs> we can't. <laughs> so right. thanks right. for jumping into the conversation, yeah. Tina. Really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I think we're going to hear more about this for sure. Um, and um, but it is promising um, that it actually came out as an official um, um, statement from CMS because it does help uh, the places that wanted to do this anyhow um, have uh, justification for the extra steps that they have to take to do it to do it safely. Um, so the one other thing I wanted to talk about is, and no, nobody's going to love what I'm going to say. <laughs> so I'm just going to say it. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you've heard about super spreaders, right? We've all heard about super spreaders. Um, yes. We have, um, you know, there was a choir in Washington State, 62 people attended. Hundreds of people got sick. This was, you know, in 2020, there was a small wedding um, in the East Coast where there were, I don't know how many attendees were. Many people got sick. People died, like eight people died. Other people were seriously ill. None of them had attended the wedding. They were all secondarily infected by somebody at that wedding. So any kind of a gathering Thanksgiving, Christmas, whatever, if it's with your direct family that you know is under control, if you have somebody who's in your family who's not, <laughs> you know, who's out there bar hopping, doesn't wear masks, then either don't invite them or know that you're putting yourself at risk. And this is really a hard conversation to have around the holidays because we want to get together with friends and family. And, um, and what whenever we do that, we don't want to be masked. Um, and so when we're indoors, we're going to be typically within six feet of each other. We're going to typically not be masked. And we may be singing, we may be shouting, we may be laughing. And when we do that, we have more droplet spray. So I'm saying this because that bubble that you've heard about your friends and family 
once you start doing holiday related stuff, you bring in people that are family, but not part of your immediate core. And when you do that multiple times, you may be putting yourself at risk. And I just want people to be thinking about that and the recommendations that are coming from healthcare and from infection prevention is when possible, still keep your family gatherings and friends in your small pod of friends or your small family, not 30, 60 people that are, you know, you see once a year. And that's super hard. Um, and then because you, you don't know if two weeks before they joined you for that event, they were out shopping and, you know, had a breach in their mask or didn't wear a mask or, you know, ate in a restaurant that maybe now has something going on. And, um, and if you don't feel like you can keep it to a small group, then just be super, super careful about the number of those bigger gatherings that you have um, and, and that you um, are protective of the people in your family that are the most vulnerable, because this is where we see the damage. It's not the, those of us that are uh, fully vaccinated and younger and whatever, it tends to be the, the other family member or that grandma, that whatever, um, that, um, that gets uh, sick and doesn't make it. Um, we've seen case reports of this all over the country and, and the holidays will just make it worse. So I just wanted to kind of remind everybody that um, you're still at risk to get infected and particularly not knowing how quickly this Omicron is gonna spread. I think we, we have to be more cautious than ever. So um, Ann Thomas had another really good question and I know it's been a huge topic of debate in our family. Do you know the best at-home test as in the most accurate? Um, the very best, and I don't know if you can even get them, are the NAAT. Um, the rapid tests have, they're quite good. The other rapid tests that are probably more available, um, but they do have some false positives and they have some false negatives. And, um, and even the um, NAAT and the, and the, um, uh, the um, specific um, antibody testing, that's the gold standard, can have false positive results less likely to have false negatives. So um, what, I've, what I've seen is an increase in the price of those test kits and harder to get of the ones that are, you know, more reliable. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, we, we have a place up in Canada and so there's all kinds of testing that is approved and not approved <laughs> and rapid tests and those that are moderated and it's a whole right. thing. There's a lot of research out there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dale, can I um, have you go back for one second about the, I have a niece in Florida who got J&J &J and she's childbearing age and she wants to get an mRNA booster um, risk childbearing age. Like what, what happens and how big is that risk? And should, she, you know, I'm going to tell her to get whatever because I want her boosted, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, if she's on contraception, um, um, it's it's not the it's the so we don't really know why it's younger women mm -hmm. who were having the um, life threatening complications from the vaccination. We did have somebody who was a young mother who wanted to be a parent at school. Wow. and was kind of an anti-vaccination person in the first place, but went ahead and got vaccinated with J&J. &J. She was in her forties and died. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, it's not just the risk of pregnancy, it's really the, the age. And so there's booster places popping up all over the place now with um, Moderna and Pfizer. I would, mm -hmm say if she can get a hold of one of those i'd do it uh, rather than do uh, more J &J. another j and j yeah. yeah 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they are mRNA. They also, I don't know whether we're going to see a difference in um, transmission with J and J vaccinated people with the Omicron or not. Um, so um, I, I just don't know. It's done quite well. Um, it as variants have come along and we've looked at other countries, the Pfizer and Moderna seem to protect better um, than J and J, you know, for some of these variants. So I, I would think that the um, one of those might be a better option anyhow with uh, Omicron popping up. Thanks. So we have just five minutes left. So if you have, if anybody has any other um, questions, go ahead and throw them on the chat or raise your hand. So with our remaining minutes, Dale, any, any final thoughts or? Well, I was just gonna say, I mean, <laughs> people will be interested in Omicron. What's really cool, not so much about the US, but about some of the other countries like United Kingdom and even in Africa, um, we will be getting fresh data on this on a pretty regular basis um, because of the national health, health system in the United Kingdom. They have data readily available really quickly and more, uh, but much better ascertainment than what we have in the US because uh, so much is state-based and you know private versus government and it's all over the place. Um, and so um, I would look to those types of sources. Um, the, again, you don't have to love the CDC, but it does have, it's sort of the central repository for data in our country around coronavirus. And um, also look at your state department of health. Um, if you're curious to know if yours is one of the states where it's shown up yet. I mean, I'm just expecting it's gonna be in every state probably, you know, before the end of this month. Um, but there, like I said, there are um, increasing numbers um, quite quickly, like daily more states popping up with the first case. They have to, you have to test it to know and not all the states are testing it as frequently as others. So just, um, just be a little bit careful. Um, try, to, try to have a great holiday season um, with, with all of the cautions um, that I've thrown out. Um, and, uh, and look towards this next year as um, full of hope because I think there are some good things on the horizon. Uh, I wish we were a little more done with this than we are. Yeah, yeah. And I just want to say thank you again to Dale. Dale spends a lot of time prepping for these meetings. And so we are going to look at our 2022 calendar. We're hopeful that we will have periodic uh, COVID community conversations we don't have them on the calendar yet as we're trying to determine um, how available Dale and some other folks might be. So stay tuned for that. Um, some of you might have seen, uh, might have gotten some notifications of uh, some uh, of the sessions from our uh, fall conference going live at noon today. And actually it's just that those sessions will be available uh, for purchase, but they're, they're the sessions from the conference. So just, just to let you know that if you see hot topics for advocates, that is actually from the conference and we're starting to, um, Ashley starting to post those. So for those that didn't attend the conference, they'll be able to, uh, attend them online. So thank you so much, Dale. Thanks Beth and, uh, Kristen, also the prep team for these community conversations, a lot goes into it. And we're very appreciative of you joining us today and happy holidays, everybody. We'll see you in the new year. Happy holidays. Yeah. Bye. 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 Yeah. Thank you.